I can always count on you for the most interesting questions. For the past few years, I've done an Ask Me Anything video and you guys never disappoint. But this year, one of your questions truly stumped me. Hi, I'm Elise from the blog Le Petit Saint Crochet. And unfortunately, I got so many questions that I'm not going to be able to answer every single one of them. And if you are one of those that I didn't get to answer your question, I sincerely apologize. Some of the questions I've answered in previous Ask Me Anything videos, and some of them I lumped together because they were very similar. But I've also grouped them according to these categories. We're going to start with crochet, then we're going to move on to amigurumi, knitting, business topics, and finally, personal questions. Before we get started, I want to let you know that you're going to find links for everything that I'm talking about in the description box below. The first question is from a longtime viewer, Kate Workman. What is your holy grail crochet item that you want to make? In other words, that incredibly special item you've been waiting to make because you need the perfect yarn or it's just not the right time yet, or maybe you haven't found the perfect pattern yet. My holy grail is not just one pattern, but I eventually want to have an entire collection of crochet toys. Now I don't want to give too much away because I haven't completely thought all of it through yet, but this is definitely going to take some time. This next question is from another longtime viewer, Sarah Ferguson. I've been trying very hard to love the imperfections in my work. I do try very hard to make sure things like arms are symmetrical and whatnot, but if something is not perfect, I'm working on loving how it turns out no matter what and accepting things as they are. How do you deal with imperfections in your creations and how do you help yourself be more open into the organic nature of our craft. This is such a great question and I think it's one that many people struggle with. Just a few years ago, I had such little confidence in myself that when I did start crocheting, I was astonished that I could make anything at all, that I was actually proud of what I could do. That doesn't mean that I wasn't blind to the fact that <laughs> there were a lot of imperfections in my work. I just felt encouraged that I was able to do something because crocheting was not something that I thought I would ever be able to do. I've shown him before, but this is the first Amigurumi toy that I ever made and I love him. I still think that he's got a lot of mistakes. He's not perfect by any means, but I was so encouraged and I thought, wow, if I can do this, I know I can get better. So I never really looked at the imperfections in my work. In the beginning, I just accepted how they were and I just knew that over time I would get better. To this day, that is still the way I feel. If I'm doing a project, especially one that's a little beyond my current abilities, I give myself a lot of grace. I still see those mistakes, but I also think those are the best teachers. Those types of projects and those mistakes are the ones that make the next project even better. The next question is about vintage crochet patterns. I learned how to crochet in the 70s from a complicated shawl pattern in Woman's Day magazine. I would love to find the pattern again to recreate it. How can you find vintage patterns? Well, your shawl sounds amazing. And I did a little bit of research and it looks like you can find vintage crochet patterns from that time period in a couple of different places. First, check the website freevintagecrochet.com. There you're going to find a lot of free patterns. And surprisingly enough, you can find vintage crochet patterns on Etsy. Now it may take some digging around to find exactly what you're looking for. And obviously the patterns on Etsy aren't going to be free, but it may be worth taking a little look. One particular shop called Mon Caribou has over 600 vintage crocheting and knitting patterns in her shop. And I will leave a link for it in the description box below. The next question is about regrets. What is one regret you have in a project you've done or never completed? And do you have a major goal for this year with your crafting? My biggest regret is that I never finished the Frida's Flowers Blanket by Janie Crow. I started it several years ago and when I bought the yarn pack, it was 100% cotton. And I've talked about it ad nauseum here on this channel, but I don't use 100% cotton very often. And for such a large project, there is no way that I can continue with that yarn because cotton doesn't have a lot of stretch and I struggle with joint issues and it aggravates my joints and it makes them not happy. So that is why I have not finished that project. I wasn't very far into it and I know that I could just buy another yarn pack, but something about kind of starting it, installing it has made me kind of fall out of love with it. I still think that it is such a gorgeous project and my 
my biggest goal is to do more designing. The next question is, have I ever tried Tunisian crochet or tried furls or Omni crochet hooks? First of all, I have never tried Tunisian crochet, but I have Tony Lipsy's gorgeous Tunisian crochet handbook in my library and I would love to try it someday. Also, yes, I use furls crochet hooks on the regular. And it's funny that you ask about the Omni crochet hooks because I may be doing an upcoming video all about new crochet hooks. The next question is about project hopping. If you're working on a project and you see another project that you think looks fun to make, how do you keep yourself from working on that other project you just saw? I have a hard time keeping to one project. Oh my goodness, how I so relate to this right now. I have several whips and here's what happens to me. It's not that I see a project and I want to do it. What happens to me is that a design pops into my head and I feel like if I don't do it right now and I don't start it this second, it's gonna leave my brain and I will never be able to capture this idea again. So that's what's been happening to me is I've been steadily working on a whip this week and then I stopped everything because I am designing a new project, which I will talk about in just a minute. And I'm just like, yeah, so I feel you. Um, I don't I don't know how to remedy that. I, I honestly don't. I wish I knew, but maybe I don't. I don't know. For me at this point, I do really feel like when that inspiration strikes, I need to jump on it. So I don't know if that helps or not. <laughs> maybe I'm just enabling you to jump from project to project, but I feel your pain. The next question is about how to stay motivated when you have lost interest in a project. I've actually been feeling like this about several projects recently, so this is very relevant to what I'm going through right now. But one thing that I did just this week was I got myself organized with all of my projects. So I wrote them all out and what I did was I wrote out the main project and then I went through and wrote down every single step I need to do to be able to finish that project. And for whatever reason, that helped me to feel like, oh, okay, this isn't so overwhelming. So sometimes I think when we lose interest in a project, it's because we feel overwhelmed and we don't know where to start and it just feels like, eh. So going through each one of those little minute steps to be able to finish the project may help. But I'm also one of those people that if you are halfway through a project and you are not loving it and you know it doesn't matter, I don't like this, I don't like the colors, I don't like the pattern, it's just not feeling right. I'm of the camp that you can frog it. Just cut your losses, don't waste any more time on things that you don't truly love. I will say that all of these projects that I've kind of lost a little bit of interest in, it doesn't mean that I don't absolutely love each and every one of them. I still love them, I still love the patterns, I still love the whole project. It's that I felt overwhelmed and I kind of lost that steam because of it. So I think it's really important to evaluate why have you lost that love and that motivation and see if you can find a remedy for that. The next question is kind of similar, but it's more about when you lose your crojo. This is a question I've always really wanted to ask as I haven't been able to find any solutions to it yet. When you're in a slump, feel especially uninspired or demotivated, how do you get past it? I bet you can relate because crocheting is also my source of therapy. So when I feel stuck like that, it gets really tough. What projects do you recommend for such a situation? Please tell us about your experience regarding this. My heart really does go out to you because yes, I completely understand. First, rest assured that you're not alone. A lot of us have lost our crojo. We've lost that motivation. We've lost that love for crocheting for a short amount of time. Sometimes it's longer than others, but it's there and it can feel so isolating. It can feel so depressing because you're like, this is my thing that I love and I don't even really want to do this right now. But I've got a video that I made not that long ago called 10 things to do when you've lost your crojo and I'll link it for you in the description box below. The next question is about how many hours a day do I commit to my crochet projects? I don't have a specific schedule or time allotted for crocheting. I naturally have a rhythm that I crochet in the evenings and it's usually around two hours a day, but I do take breaks. I don't crochet every single day. The next question is, if I could be any crocheting or knitting tool, what would it be? I would be a crochet hook and here's why. Obviously we use a crochet hook when we're crocheting, but for those of you who aren't knitters, 
maybe you don't realize that we can use a crochet hook for knitting purposes as well. You can use it if you've dropped a stitch and you can also use it when you are picking up stitches and there might be other ways that I don't even know how you would use it with knitting, but that's why I love the crochet hook. It's such a versatile tool. The next question is, what should I do if my blanket is shrinking? First of all, I'm going to assume that you don't mean that you put your crochet blanket in the washing machine and the dryer and then it shrunk. I'm assuming what you mean is that you've started a blanket and it started out like this and it's starting to look more like a trapezoid and somehow it is not it's not as big as it was when you started. So here are a few things that you need to check. Number one, are you using the same crochet hook size that you started with? Number two, how's your tension? Were you more relaxed when you started and you've gotten tenser and so your stitches are smaller? And one way to check that is to look at the size of stitches down near the area towards the bottom of the blanket and then look at your stitches up top and see, are they approximately the same size or are you getting tighter and tighter and tighter? And finally, and this would be the one that I would guess is likely the problem is that you are losing stitches somewhere. And this typically happens at the beginning and at the end of a row. And I would look back at your pattern and see how many stitches did you start out with and you need to count and see how many stitches do you have now. If you are off on your count, you know that that's the problem and you need to rip back. You need to frog your work until you have the correct amount of stitches. Now, one of the easiest ways to lose your stitch is at the beginning of the round and at the end of the round. And what I like to do is get a stitch marker and put it in the first stitch of the row and the last stitch of the row because that's the most likely place that you've been losing stitches. Hope that helps. The next question is, do I prefer to frog little mistakes or am I less of a perfectionist? And the answer to that is it kind of depends. If it's a small mistake or if it's super noticeable, I'm gonna rip it out. And if I know it's gonna drive me absolutely batty, I am frogging it because I'll never be able to unsee it. But I do have an exception, and that is when I'm working on a challenging project. If I am learning something new, and say I realize 10 rows back that I made a mistake and it's a small one, I'm living with it. I'm not gonna stress about it and I just go on with my day. And I look at that as, oh wow, that was a really good teacher. I always feel like mistakes are the best teachers that you will ever have. So whether you frog that mistake or if you just leave it in there because it's not gonna bother you, I think that's really a personal choice. The next question is how to read a crochet pattern. And I've got a video for you and I will link it for you in the description box below. The next question is, how do I know what crochet hook size to use for my yarn? The best place to start is if you're using a pattern and to look and see what does the designer recommend. If you aren't using a pattern or that information isn't available, your yarn label is the next best place to look. Most of them have a recommended crochet hook size that will get you started. And if you've lost that label, you now have two different choices. Number one, you could just experiment and see which crochet hook size feels the best and looks the best and is giving you the right combination of hook and yarn that you're looking for. And number two is to do the wraps per inch test. The wraps per inch test is going to let you know what weight yarn you have. And then based on what weight yarn you have, you can look at a chart to see which size crochet hook you need to use. And I'll leave a link for a great chart from Joy of Motion Crochet where she lists out all the different weight yarns and then all the different recommended crochet hook sizes. And for the wraps per inch test, I have a video explaining exactly how to do it. It's in my Dollar Tree Yarns video and it's towards the end and I show you exactly how to do it. The next question is, how many projects crocheting or knitting can you do in a week? Which crochet or knitting projects is your favorite, like amigurumi, home decor, or garments? First of all, I'm actually not a very fast crocheter or a knitter, so I don't think I could really complete a whole project, except for an, a small amigurumi project. I could probably get one of those done in a week, but that's about it. And any other project, especially knitting, is going to take me a much, much longer time. But my favorite projects to make are amigurumi toys. My friend Don from the YouTube channel Don's Days asked this question. Where's your favorite place to crochet? Don't say the loo, LOL. Don has such a great personality, and if you haven't checked out her YouTube channel, make sure you do. She has a vlogging channel, and 
and she also has a crafting channel, The Woven Almanac, and I'll leave links for both of those in the description box below. But my favorite place to crochet is in my living room in my comfy chair, and I put my feet up on my ottoman, and usually there'll be a little kitty cat named Pickle in my lap, and that is my favorite place to crochet. Now we're moving on to the Amigurumi category, and the first question is, Hi Elise, I've been wondering about this question for a while now. Why do you love making amigurumi? This is such a good question, and I think the most basic and the truest answer is that it helps me to tap in to that childlike happiness. It just reminds me of being a kid again, and it just makes me happy. And I think that's one of the things that I love about amigurumi the most is that the only purpose of an amigurumi toy is to make someone happy. It's there to make them smile. It's there for a child to love and to play with. There is no other other purpose than to bring joy into the world, and I think this world needs as much joy as we can bring to it. The next question is about selling amigurumi. If you're selling items you've made using someone else's pattern, how do you credit the pattern designer? The first thing that I always do is to check to make sure that the pattern designer gives permission for people to sell their finished objects, and usually that's at the back of the pattern or it's somewhere in the book, and it will explicitly say, yes, you are able to sell finished items on a limited basis. And what they're trying to say there is that you are not going to manufacture these in a sweatshop somewhere and produce hundreds of them for sale. And sometimes they'll have very specific wording that they want you to use, which could be something like I do on my patterns that just says designed by Le Petit Saint Crochet. What I like to do is just add a little tag to any amigurumi toy that I've made. And I will put something cute on the front, like its little name. And then on the back, it will say that I made it and this this is the designer. So that's the way that I like to give credit to those designers. If you're looking for some little tags to add to your Amigurumi toys, make sure to check out my Amigurumi adoption kits. You'll find them on my website or you'll find them in my Etsy shop. The next question is about designing amigurumi patterns. What are the first steps to creating your own amigurumi patterns? Are there courses or is it a case of just do it? The first thing that I recommend is get really comfortable making other people's amigurumi patterns. That's going to help you get used to the common ways that amigurumi are designed. And the second thing is it's going to help you to be able to read the pattern well and know what to look for in a good pattern. So that way, when you're ready to design your pattern, you know what to look for. One great resource is the Complete Guide to Crochet Dolls and Animals. This is a fantastic manual for all of us who love to make amigurumi, but especially for those who want to design toys. And I also have an entire video called Eight Easy Steps to Becoming an Amigurumi Designer that will go into a lot more detail about how you can do it too. The next question is about those darn amigurumi heads. Tips to get your amigurumi heads nice and round. I always struggle with that. And how do you keep your amigurumi Rimmy heads from wobbling. First is you want to stuff that head firmly. You're gonna put more stuffing in the head than you will any other part of the body. And when you stuff it all down and you think you're good, add a little bit more. The next thing that you want to do is smooth the outside of the head with your hands. That's something that I spend actually quite a bit of time doing. And you wouldn't think that just rubbing your hands over the head would actually help to shape it, but it really does. And for those wobbly necks, what I like to do is just cut inexpensive pieces of felt that I bought at the craft store and you can cut them as long or as short as you need and roll them up to the width of the neck. And I just stuff it down in there. So I'll have the stuffing in the body. Then I put the rolled up piece of felt in the neck area and then I can stuff the head. And sometimes I may need to put a little bit of stuffing around, but I usually like to have enough felt that it really fills up that entire neck cavity. That's the way that I like to do it because you can make it as wide or as narrow as you need. And one thing that people have shared with me in the comment section is that they've gone and bought foam hair rollers from the dollar store and they stuff those down into the neck because they're really secure and they're really solid. The next question about amigurumi is there any way to make safety eyes more secure? If you're making a toy for an infant or a small toddler and choking is a concern, I recommend not using safety eyes at all. I would just embroider the eyes and they can look so adorable. I actually have a whole video and I have an entire Pinterest board for amigurumi eyes. So if you're thinking that embroidered eyes won't really look as cute, they really, really will. So I will link that in the description box below as well. Here are a few ideas if you want to use safety eyes 
size and they're not going to be a choking hazard is I have found that the quality of the safety eye actually matters a lot when it comes to keeping the backs on. I've been buying safety eyes from Glass Eyes Online and 6060 Eyes and I will leave links for both of those shops in the description box below. The quality of the safety eyes is night and day from what I used to buy on Amazon and especially the backs. There's no difference. They're so much better. Number two, I've been using a safety eye tool that pushes the back onto that safety eye so far in, there's no way that I'm going to be able to get it out. So it's really, really secure. And I'll leave a link for that safety eye tool. People love it. Many people have let me know that they've purchased it and loved it and it's pretty inexpensive. The next question is, what is the best way to wash your amigurumi and can you put it in the washing machine and dryer? I only spot clean my amigurumi, but I went and checked an article by Little World of Whimsy, which I will link to in the description box below. And she goes through and talks about the different ways that you can can wash amigurumi. And she says that if you are using acrylic yarn, that it should be fine to be able to wash and dry it because acrylic yarn should be able to go right in your washer and your dryer. But always, always, always check your yarn label first. But if you're using 100% cotton, you would want to wash it in cold water and you'd want to dry it at the lowest heat possible because it could cause your toy to shrink. And if it's wool, I would not recommend washing it in a washing machine at all because there's the risk that it could felt and shrink and all kinds of other things could happen. The next question is, how do you make a magic ring without it opening back up? I have a tutorial on my channel, which I will link to in the description box below for the way that I make a magic ring and I have never had it open back up. The next question is, do you have an all time favorite Amigurumi project? <sighs> hmm trying to think. Favorite, favorite all-time Amigurumi project. To be honest, this question has me totally stumped. I don't have one favorite. There are so many that have taught me so many things or that I just love them so much. There are some of them that are my designs and some of them that other designers have created. I don't have a favorite one. You stumped me, I don't have a favorite Amigurumi toy. The next question is, what are your thoughts on chunky yarn and chunky plushies? Well, I think they're totally adorable and I've actually made three of them with chunky yarn and I love how they feel. They work up so quickly and they are so cute. We are finally into the knitting category and the first and most popular question was, do you like crocheting or knitting better? And the answer to that question is, I love them both for different reasons. I like crocheting toys better, but I like knitting garments more. The next question is, do you enjoy crocheting or knitting garments for yourself? To be honest, I don't knit or crochet a lot of garments, but I am in the middle of knitting a Norwegian kofta or what we would call a cardigan. And that that is something that I want to learn more and to explore more are knitted color work cardigans and sweaters and scarves. And I absolutely love color work. I love stranded knitting. I love Fair Isle. I love traditional Norwegian knitting. It's so beautiful. And yes, I would love to continue making garments. And I have a book that has been calling to me over and over again for me to pick it up and start looking through it and to make some projects. And that's the Charming Color Work Socks by Stone knits. And boy, I cannot wait to make some of these socks. They are so beautiful. Oh my goodness, they're so gorgeous. But I haven't had time yet, so it still sits on my shelf. And one of these days, I'm going to knit myself another pair of color work socks. The next question is, do you have a favorite crochet pattern designer other than yourself? Someone that you will pick up almost every pattern they produce. And I know I just said we're in the knitting section and that's because this answer goes in the knitting section. So I don't really have a favorite crochet designer that I'm going to pick up all of their patterns but I do have a favorite knitting designer that I love everything she does. And if you've ever been here before, you may know who this person is, but it's Julie Williams from Little Cotton Rabbits. Now I haven't purchased every single pattern that she's published, but I have a lot of her patterns. In my opinion, Julie is the epitome 
of the perfect knitted toy designer. In my opinion, nobody designs toys that are as beautiful as Julie's. And it's not just that her toys are so beautiful because they are, but it's this magical world that she has created with her blog and her Instagram that I have just fallen in love with. And she's also a mom of a son with special needs and she shares the challenges and the triumphs of parenting a child with different needs. And I really connect with that because I have an adult son with special needs as well. And I just love this whole world that she's created. I love her vulnerability. I love her artistic talent. If you haven't ever checked out the Little Cotton Rabbit's patterns or gone to her blog and looked at her beautiful photography and read her wonderful words, I will leave a link for it in the description box below. The next question is, do you have a recommendation for a pattern for an intermediate knitter who wants to step up her game from scarves and simple blankets? Well, I do, and I love that you're ready to step up your game and move out of your comfort zone. And I'm going to recommend the Little Cotton Rabbits if you have any interest in working on toys. They are wonderful, delightful, whimsical patterns, and they are so well written. And I think that it would be a little bit of a challenge but it would be so much fun to make too. Also check out the Mary Jane's Tea Room patterns. She also creates the most beautiful knitted toys and they are very well-written patterns as well. I love them so much. But if you're not interested in toys, you might want to start looking into knitting socks. Now I wouldn't start with color work socks, but I would check out the Crazy Sock Lady here on YouTube. She has an entire channel dedicated to knitting socks, and I think that's amazing. And I'll leave a link for all of those things in the description box below. All right, now we are on to business topics. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. When you started your business, did you focus on markets slash craft fairs or specifically online? How do you know what to charge? I actually did an entire video for helping you come up with the prices for your handmade items, and I'll leave it in the description box below. It's called How to Price Your Amigurumi Toys for Sale. But this could apply to any handmade items that you're making. I have never done a craft fair or a market, so I don't have any specific information on that, but I sold most of my toys online and I did do some local selling if people reached out to me and they wanted to buy a toy. At one point, I considered selling my toys in a local boutique and here are the two reasons why I decided not to. They would take 40% once the toy sold, which was a lot. Those are some really high fees right there. And I understood why, because you have to take up shelf space in their little store and I just felt like, number one, that wasn't really a great deal for me. I was either going to take a huge loss on those toys or I would need to jack up the price so high just to make up for that lost 40%. And I just didn't think that was fair for anybody. And number two, one thing that I really worried being in a retail space was people putting their hands on the toys, getting them dirty, and then me not being able to sell them because they're ruined. So those are the reasons why I decided to just sell online because I can control a lot more. The next question is also about selling. If you bought a pattern, do you have the right to sell the crocheted knitted finished product. Also, if you make something of a famous character, can you get into trouble? We answered the first part of that question. You should always check with the designer just to see if they permit people selling finished objects from their designs. But the second part of this question is really important for us crocheters and knitters to understand. If you are trying to sell finished items from a trademarked design, yes, you can get into trouble. I would steer clear of selling anything, whether it be a finished object or a pattern from a recognizable character from TV, movies, or books. Of course, with the exception that you have permission from the owner of that trademark. For example, my friend Lee Sartori from Coco Crochet Lee just came out with her brand new Pokemon Amigurumi book. She and the publisher have an agreement. She is allowed to create patterns of those trademarked designs because she has a relationship with the publisher and the publisher has a relationship with the owner of that trademark. That's the only way that I would ever do that is if you have a 
signed contract with somebody who has permission from the trademark owner to be able to create those designs. Here's an example of this exact situation playing out recently. And this is an article from Crochet Kim and it perfectly exemplifies what we're talking about here. In 2019, the Disney series, The Mandalorian, created waves in the crafting community. When the show initially aired, Disney had not produced any toys or plushies for the character known as Baby Yoda or Grogu in an attempt to maintain secrecy around the show's main plot. However, fans of the show fell in love with the adorable character, so the crafting community rose to meet the demand. Crochet patterns for Grogu flooded the market, as did crocheted plushies of the popular character. Crocheters and pattern designers who hopped on this trademark trend were quickly punished by Disney. Not only had they taken Disney's intellectual property, but they had also cut into the profits Disney stood to make from selling the Grogu plushies they intended to release later. While some creators were simply sent cease and desist letters, some lost their shops while others faced fines. I'm gonna leave a link for the entire article in the description box below because I think this is something that we as makers need to to understand. I don't wanna get into trouble, so I steer clear of those types of things. Now that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to make those toys. I can take Lee's book and I can make those characters. What I can't do is I'm not allowed to sell them. Another thing that you want to avoid is creating pattern for licensed characters and then trying to sell those patterns. You also are not allowed to do that. So unless I'm giving something as a gift or I'm just making it for me, I steer very clear away from those because if you try to sell them or you try to make any kind of money off of their intellectual property, especially big companies like Disney, I'm not going against them. I'm just a little guy. No way. The next question is how can someone learn to write crochet patterns to sell? Learning how to write a crochet pattern is not as difficult as it seems, but there is definitely a learning curve. I took the crochet pattern writing workshop by Edie Ekman and it is excellent. There are 18 self-paced lessons and you're going to be learning from Edie Ekman. And if you don't know, Edie Ekman is very well known in the crochet community. She's published many books and patterns and she is a well-known teacher. I highly recommend having your pattern pattern tested and tech edited. Now those are two completely separate things. For getting your pattern tested, you usually just find someone who is a maker who would like to actually crochet or knit the pattern for you and then provide their feedback. But a tech editor is actually a trained professional who will be able to look through your pattern with a fine tooth comb to look for errors in the way that you have phrased things. They will also look for mathematical errors and they are worth their weight in gold. And I'm going to leave a link for my new tech editor. Her name is Stephanie from Pink Posy Crochet. She has done a wonderful job for me and I will leave a link for her on Instagram. You can DM her on Instagram or you can also email her. The next business question question is a good one. What has been the hardest thing about making your crochet business YouTube channel successful? Any tips for those who are hoping to get started but are kind of intimidated by it? The hands down hardest thing that I had to overcome was not believing in myself. Learning all the skills of being able to run a business and to have a YouTube channel pale in comparison to the thoughts that I had in my head about my own limitations. For my entire life, I had a limited belief about myself. I thought that I couldn't do a lot of things. I struggled to learn new things because I just thought, well, that's, that's too hard, I can't do that. And I limited myself for so long, but when I had this desire to do something more with crochet, I had to battle in my own brain that I could do this. I could do this because my natural tendency was to say, well, you can't do that. Who are you? You don't know anything. I'm telling you guys at that time, when I first started my business, I could not even put an attachment in an email. That's how technologically challenged I was. But my mindset has been the thing that I have worked the hardest to overcome. And I really want to encourage you that yes, it is intimidating. There are so many things that you need to learn. I would recommend just taking one step at a time and I've got some resources for you, but I think you have to start to believe in yourself. I am living proof that if I can do it, you can do it. I've taken several courses that have truly helped me, but I'm going to give you 
three of the ones that are great for beginners. The first is the Create Your Blog Dream Course by Lisa from Farmhouse on Boone. That was the very first course that I took, and that's if you want to start a blog, if you ever think that you're going to have patterns that you want to put out to the world, that would be a great place to start. The second is she has her YouTube Success Academy as well. That one helped me to be able to know how to actually start a YouTube channel. What button do you push to say, start my YouTube channel? How do I film? How do I upload it to YouTube? She goes into the nitty gritty of those things and it's very foundational and fundamental. And the great thing is that she is continually updating the class as new things come up. So that's really wonderful. And there's an active Facebook community for both of those programs. So I highly recommend both of those. Also, another great one is Crochetpreneur by Pam Grice. That's great for those of you who are crocheters and you want to start your business the right way way. It is not YouTube specific. There'll be some things in there about doing video, but if you really want a YouTube course, I would highly recommend the YouTube Success Academy by Lisa. And I will leave links for all of them in the description box below. We have made it to the personal category and here's the first question. What does your family think of your hobby now business? Are they supportive? Do they think you spend too much time crocheting? Do they roll your eyes when you talk about crochet? I want to know everything. My family is really, really supportive and I'm so thankful for that, especially my husband. My husband is my biggest cheerleader. But I honestly don't talk to them a lot about crocheting because all but one of my kids is interested in crocheting, and that's my daughter, Megan, and she actually likes to crochet a little bit. But my other kids and my husband don't crochet at all, and they don't really have any interest in it, so I don't really talk to them about it because it would just be a one-way street and that's not interesting to me at all. But yes, they are very, very supportive. The next question is about how is the wedding planning going? Well, we are now five weeks away from the wedding. <laughs> There's so much left to do. We are so excited about it. And I'm, I'm at that point where I just want to get to the actual day because all this planning is a little bit stressful. I just cannot wait for the actual day to be here. I finally got my dress, which was so stressful for me. I don't really enjoy clothes shopping. That's something that I really don't enjoy. But last weekend, my other daughter, Caroline, and my mom and I all went down to Charlotte to go to the big mall down there and to go shop for things to wear to the wedding. And thank goodness, I found something that I really like and my daughter liked it as well. So we're getting down to the wire and I'm just ready for that day. It's gonna be amazing. The next question is about how do I balance work and family responsibilities. How do you balance work and home responsibilities, especially working from home? I'm finding it increasingly difficult to keep up with my home activities as my crochet business is taking up more of my limited time. Oh boy, this is a topic that has been on my mind so much lately. So I've got a lot of tips for you. Until very, very recently, and I mean like two weeks ago, I was feeling completely overwhelmed with how I want to take care of my family while also doing everything that I want to do for my business. But I started listening to the Systemize Your Life podcast by Chelsea Joe. This is something that I highly, highly recommend to anybody who is trying to get your life together. And I ended up buying her course because number one, I love learning new things. I am a course junkie. I just want you all to know that if it's a good course, I'm gonna buy it. This one, to be honest, has been truly life-changing for me. These last two weeks, I have been more productive. I have been happier. I feel so much peace. And it's because I have gotten my life systemized. I've never found a program that could help you to get your personal life in order while also getting your work at home life together. And Chelsea is a work from home mom of two. Her husband's a firefighter. I felt like I could really relate to somebody like that because we have a very crazy schedule. My husband travels all the time. He's not home a lot. And although my children are older, I still have a lot of family responsibilities. And I was finding it incredibly difficult trying to keep up with all of them. And she really dials in on systemizing your life. And I really recommend that every single person who is feeling this way, go listen to the one episode with Sigoni. So I've talked about Sigoni Macaroni on here before, and she was on the Systemize Your Life podcast. And that episode changed my life because I realized 
This was the answer to everything that I have been looking for. I have been praying for a way for me to be able to do all of these things. So I will leave a link for that specific episode in the description box below. And if you want to run a business or you're trying to do all these things at home, just go listen to it. It's really going to be wonderful for you. The next question is how many whips do I currently have? I used to be a one whip gal. I was so prideful about how I only had one whip at a time and now I have more than one whip, let's just say that. I have five and it stresses me out, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. But I've systemized all of my projects, all of my whips, and that has made me feel a lot better. But I am still working on the Norwegian kofta. I am designing a bride and groom amigurumi doll for my daughter's upcoming wedding. We'll see if that gets done in time. I am still working on my amigurumi duck pattern that is this close to being done. And I have the granny square table runner that I am this close to finishing that's not done yet either. And finally, I have the island stroll pillow that I've been working on for a year. <laughs> And that is something that I really, really, really want to finish. So those are all of my whips. I hope you enjoyed our time together and answering all your questions. And I hope that I was able to answer yours. And I hope you all stay safe out there and happy stitching.